I don't think we want to make him sit in the pool. Let's see how. All right. How long? Uh, four, four minutes. Yeah. How about? How are we? What's our time? Um, uh, yeah. What time? What? Uh, what? Uh, what uh, what uh, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 here we go. Too. Yeah, that was great. We do have that much material. So, uh, if you can't use the arms and stuff, then we can do this. I know, right? This is a, a lot of that. Hey, everybody. Hello. I'm Alex. Uh, I work here at Flyleaf Books. Um, so on behalf of Flyleaf, thank you for coming tonight, uh, for supporting your local indie bookstore. Um, events like these and book sales at them are what allow us to keep having these events. So thank you very much for coming. Right. This evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from Will York about his new book, Who Cares Anyway? Post-Punk San Francisco and the End of the Analog Age. He is joined by Dan Partridge. Will York has written about music for the San Francisco Bay Guardian, Alternative Press, and AllMusic.com, and is the co-author with Michael Belfer of When Can I Fly, The Sleepers, and Tuxedo Moon and Beyond. Born and raised in Raleigh, he graduated from UNC Chapel Hill in 1991, or 1999, sorry, <laughs> um, before spending his young adulthood in San Francisco. A lot of you might have done that already. <laughs> Dan Partridge is the production director for the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. Prior to this role, he served as the research associate for the Jazz Loft Project at the Center for Documentary Studies, was the CDS Exhibitions and Public Programs Assistant, the coordinator and teaching assistant for the Sound Shadows Program at the Governor Moorhead School in Raleigh, and a WXYC DJ. <laughs> We hope you enjoy this event. Thank you again, and remember to buy a copy of Who Cares Anyway up front after reading if you don't already have one. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. And uh, this, is, this height is a little awkward, but I'm not gonna really be standing up here very too much, but we're gonna begin with a little audio uh, excerpt. We'll see how much of this you can endure. Uh, the scene here, uh, the mic comes out and like, uh, right. yeah. yeah, you can take I, it out. I, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, so uh, to set the scene here, I was uh, in the middle of one of my sets at WXYC, where I was also a DJ. This would have been probably 1998, and some abstract music was playing, and Dan was in the station, and he came up and uh, brought the CD. Well, I'll show you what the CD is in just a minute, but he said, you gotta play this song. And so, well, this track, I should say. And so. I could give away a free I could give away a free copy of the book to anyone who could name the uh, the artist but this was a uh, a track from the Shut it down there's going to be some silences in here. This was a track from the 1996 album America's Funny Man by Neil Hamburger. And the premise is uh, this is a, a psych gag that he's recorded. Um, uh, audio only format. And uh, Dan, uh, must, have known, must have known something. 
I'm going to ask you exactly maybe if you can possibly remember what you were thinking. But in a way, this is what set me set me on uh, the path that led to uh, led from one thing to another to another to another, and ultimately resulted in uh, this uh, doorstop of a, of a book. Um, now, why? Why? Now, you might be thinking, uh, is this an entire book about uh, audio sight gags? No. Um, but what can we say about this? What, what did you, before, we, before I get back into the backstory, um, oh, cool. what was, okay. what, do you remember your first encounter with Neil Hamburger and what it was about that track in particular that I intrigued you? Yeah, I mean, it was just a unique track at the time. Um, I mean, I think you could. I think your mic is not. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm not used to this kind of microphone. This is like a post COVID, a little nerve wracking <laughs> being this close. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think this guy, Neil Hamburger, is uh, AKA uh, real life person, Greg Turkington, is pretty well known. But at the time, that was pretty much a novelty. And I think, I'm assuming this was late night. Uh, when you were on the air, and uh, Will was probably playing a lot of avant-garde uh, jazz with little percussion sounds in it, and I just thought that this track would would go well with that. I probably tried to do something like that on my own set, like integrate that um, instead of the more overt um, tracks. And I don't remember, but he's you know he's a bad comedian, um, and he stands up there with. For those that don't know, I know a lot of people do, but. Um, you know, with like three drinks and, you know, goes through the set, he's got the tuxedo and like a pretty severe comb over and all that sort of thing. But this was a pretty genius track to me because I'd never heard anything that integrated that kind of uh, construction. And it also sounded like probably the same kind of spare sparse drumming from a, like an avant-garde uh, recording that might have been on air, like a 12 to 3 uh, radio shift. Probably to the chagrin of, of some of some people nearby, but I was definitely way into some very serious music, or so I thought at the time. And so, the uh, the very conceptual sense of humor on this was something that that got me. And I remember looking at the package, and you can read some testimonials from the Titius fans on the back, and looking at the credits, and just the entire way that it was packaged and presented was so different from anything I had come across, and. I'll keep this relatively brief here, but what I would notice in the coming months was different records that would have this uh, label on the back, uh, Amarillo, Amarillo Records. Well, that doesn't have the label, but uh, with strange packaging like this, or there's no records in here, that's why it's flopping around, or this. And so, again, not maybe the most beautiful image here, but the way that, that they played with the, the way that they were presenting the music and presenting these backstories or giving these backstories, you open up this one and there is a very realistic looking uh, legal document, interviews with both of the band members and they're talking about uh, a lawsuit that one of them has filed against the other one, a very bitter breakup, but this was a breakup of a band that not many people cared about or knew about in the first place. And so as I was reading this, I was wondering, you know, is this real or is this the most, uh, you know, subtle humor uh, imaginable? And it turned out it was the latter, but as I continued to, to dig through or to, to come across different things in this orbit of Amarillo Records, I was able to get some of the, the zines that uh, Greg Turkington had done in the 1980s uh, called Breakfast Without Meat. And just sort of one thing led to another and to another. And right before I was getting ready to move uh, to San Francisco in 1999, I was going to do a Thursday night feature uh, on WXYC on Amarillo Records. It turned out it was double booked and uh, the other person there, did you know that was you? No, <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> I showed up there and you already had all your records pulled and you were doing music of the mind oh, or yeah. something like that. Yes, and so. Uh, yeah, that was a. Uh, in motion. Yeah, it was in motion. And so I, I had this idea that, well, I'm going to do something about this Amarillo Records thing. And at one point I was going to do a zine, but that wasn't really working. Uh, this was in the 2000s, and so zines were kind of on their way out. 
Uh, but in the meantime, I started to write for the, uh, started writing for the San Francisco Day Guardian, so kind of like the Indie Week or something like that. And just every now and then, even though I was mostly writing about current music, I would have some opportunity to interview someone from the 90s or the 80s. Uh, Greg himself introduced me to a couple of people, um, my show and tell here. One of them was this guy Joe from the Papo Pies, who had this reissue. And it turned out that the Papo Pies were known for playing uh, entire sets of one song, uh, Truckin' by the Grateful Dead and uh, driving audiences insane. And their backing band, his backing band uh, was uh, originally, or at one point, essentially uh, the members of Faith No More before they went on to, to be famous. And at another point, some members of Mr. Bungle uh, during, uh, you know, per they were performing anonymously. Then Greg also put me in touch eventually with uh, someone from Flipper, which was one of Greg's favorite bands. And that opened up another um, door or uh, rabbit hole. And so that took me further back into the early 80s. And then finally, uh, in trying to understand the roots of Flipper, I found out about uh, The Sleepers. And I meant to bring that book, but uh, The Sleepers. And so they were one of the first punk bands uh, in San Francisco, formed in 1977, really Palo Alto, but they were up there, and so uh, in the end, I wound up interviewing 111 different people, um, some of them, many of them more than once, and uh, trying to whittle that down into the modest uh, 560 pages that this book makes up. But it was something that really unfolded over a 20-year period with, a brief, with an intermission for graduate school. But uh, in a sense, uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating, but it really kind of kicked off with these things that I came across at WXYC. So that's the origin story. So basically, you didn't get to do your Thursday night feature, but you got to sit through mine, and now, 23 years later, you're sitting through yours. I brought you back for revenge. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but it's not just that he played uh, the X-rated hot dog vendor for me. There's, a, and what I want to hear from Dan is some history, some local history that I don't really know, has to do with his uh, the band Pine State that he was in that I somehow never got to see, but um, they toured with um, a different lineup than the one you were in, but they toured with one of Greg's bands with this not so nice name in 1995 and opened for them at the Duke Coffee House. And I always got the sense that there was a small group at XYC who really got this stuff early on, but they all predated me Dan was still around. Most of them were kind of scattered. And I was curious what, when you first came across this, this any of this, this orbit of stuff and what you made of it and how you, uh, how it stood, uh, how it struck you compared to other things you were familiar with. Okay, so that show at the Duke Coffee House in 95 was set up by one of our bandmates, Charlie Spate, and I, texted him last night to figure out how that happened because he would set us up with these these bands and we'd go on these, these tours starting at that year and then I think 96 and 97 we toured with bands uh, called Smackdown and uh, Strato Tanker. We played with one of those New Zealand bands um, that's kind of famous, not the clean, but one of the offshoots of that band. but. Charlie basically like took one of these records and looked on the back of it, and there was um, one of these not not one that we have, but one from this thing, and and he um, there was a phone number, and it was for Al Marillo, um, so at Amarillo Records, and then this guy Al Marillo, then I guess Greg Turkington, the guy in the clip had, so he just called that number up off the blue and, um, and we did that with several different um, bands that we wanted to reach out to uh, another kind of outsider quote unquote outsider band uh, Wesley Willis we talked to those people and tried got on the phone with them late night but he just called him up and the, the in that day uh, telephones were a little more uh, a little less private so he just put his number on the back of a record and I think Charlie was the first person who ever called him up out of the blue and um, uh, Greg Turkington also has a pretty uh, extensive history of doing crank telephone calls as well. Yeah. And 
and so it was easy for him to just kind of slip into character mm -hmm. um, and start up a conversation with Charlie, which led to a friendship. I mean, Charlie's a little bit more of an entrepreneurial guy, so he was able to kind of parlay that into convincing them to come to to Durham and play. And it should be noted that the Duke Coffee House at the time had a really strong booking uh, agent, Jeremy Steckler. Um, and even if he wasn't still around, his legacy was still strong. And y'all can correct me. I know there's people in the room who know some of this stuff better than me in the corners. But um, my impression is that, you know, the fertile ground of the WXYC, but also the WXDU and the, the Duke Coffee House scene, you know, created like a venue where you could actually drop someone into and, and have a, a show. So that's, that's how it got set up. Um, my interest was more as a DJ. Like I hadn't listened to those albums when we played with them, and I was actually taking like a lot of classes. And you know, I think Scott uh, Craddock, who's in the audience, played that show right in '95 at the Coffee House. Yeah, uh, not the one with the not the one with ZCR. But, okay, um, that was like a couple months before. Yeah. Right. So I was the only percussionist available, and I was not really a drummer. I would just smash things or play like um, <laughs> the radiators or trash cans or things like that. But I was the only one available. Um, so we kind of tag team that tour with different percussionists, and that led to Scott joining the band shortly after this show you're talking about. But yeah, it was interesting. Um, I actually like the more straightforward um, tracks from the other band. Oh, U.S. Saucer. From the U.S. Saucer band, who had a really sweet indie rock sound, but also came from the same background. And we're, we're these kind of avant-garde thinkers who were doing the straight-up music. Um, so yeah, that would have been 95. And then we quickly recognized the need to add a, a fourth drummer, a third drummer. <laughs> Yeah, and, um, that's that's pretty much it. Like uh, Charlie made the connection, and these guys were, you know, on the phone, and then he booked this these tours, and we could take a tour. We'd start here and go up to somewhere like, not Richmond, but we'd go to like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, Durham, and other places may or may not fall into that. Um, Nashville. What's that? Nashville. I didn't go to Nashville, <laughs> but yeah, they did. They went to Nashville and. and basically created a bunch of havoc at the Grand Ole Opry in character as our band. So there was a lot of that in the air at the time, and it felt pretty free. Uh, I want to backtrack to that um, CD. Uh, you know, now you could just look that up on the internet and be like, oh, I know who that is. That's Greg Turkington, and he's been on the Da 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 show. And, but back in the day, like, you, it was a little bit more like hand-to-hand, like passing information. So I, I really like this the title, the analog, uh, end of the analog age, because even though the, the, the internet existed back then, like you really weren't getting the information spread that way. And so some of these conceits um, that people use for their band or the way they structured it um, could last longer without the curtain, uh, without anybody seeing the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, um, which I think is really unique to that time period. Right, I was going to say if, if, if uh, we had any young whippersnappers here, but they're on spring break, but you know, <laughs> yeah. there was a time. But it really was, like, right when I was getting into this stuff, was right at the cusp, because I, um, on the one hand, uh, I didn't call Greg, I emailed him, because I had ordered some records, and actually, the reason that this record in particular, with its uh, you know, off-color cover, uh, has a specific, uh, you know, plays a specific role is that I ordered it and it was physically warped and so I emailed him and like Dan said Greg had a reputation for not only the prank calls but also for uh, if somebody came at him the wrong way he could knock him down like whether the heckler or something so I was a little worried that he might tell me you know go stuff it but he was incredibly polite said uh, you know he'd ship me another one and if that one was warped he'd ship me a box of 50 of them because uh, he was the record was that considered that much of a failure, that much of a dud, even by <laughs> their standards. And so that really, that idea of, you know, you do something, there's a risk to it, and you might fall flat on your face. Uh, even though that was kind of the metaphor of the backstory of the band, it actually happened as well. I mean, he said that that record was a 
was a failure that took him some time to kind of recover from because it, it didn't really go over well. And so, um, but just like Dan was saying, there was this idea of you know, what is going on here? How do I figure this out? And not, instead of having that opinion or understanding shaped by uh, some internet pundit or, or critic, I felt like this is kind of like mine in the sense that I can try to make sense of it without somebody else's, uh, without really knowing what's going on. And like Dan was saying, that was <clears throat> something that you could still do in that, that era. Now, I'm going to be the first one to look something up now if I can, but um, so, you know, times change and, and we change with them. That, that, that idea of the end of the analog age is really what I was, was going for, kind of realizing and researching and, and trying to write and finish this book that that was a very specific era for do it yourself culture. And if you think of, the late 70s when the idea of when punk rock comes along and the idea of do-it-yourself and Xerox machines, again, cover, uh, Xerox machines, uh, even four track tape recorders were not even accessible at that point. Everything was very hands-on and uh, IRL, in real life. And that's how you know, people, when I'd interview them about the late 70s and early 80s, uh, in particular, they would tell me the importance of things like the movie theaters uh, in San Francisco or certain cafes or, or uh, North Beach had that, that culture with the leftover from the Bohemians and the, excuse me, not the Bohemians, the Beats, the, that Bohemian kind of atmosphere. And so there's a lot of history that's unique to San Francisco, but it, it, at the same time, it also, for me, kind of helped me understand my, my youth. I mean, the, the years in which I grew up, it's kind of this parallel history because let's face it, even, uh, People who are into underground music are not going to be familiar with a lot of these bands because San Francisco was kind of like an island that didn't really uh, connect to the rest of the country. Um, oh yeah, and that was going to be my one other point about WXYC is that uh, I was thinking about this as uh, as San Francisco is to the rest of the country, or at least as it was. Uh, WXYC kind of is to, uh, to to UNC and Chapel Hill. It's this place where you have a lot of extreme sometimes odd, eccentric characters in one place. And uh, that sort of, uh, yeah, I think it's important to have those places, even if they're not gonna necessarily be a model for the rest of Yeah, the, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I mean, it felt like that time was the 90s and the 80s, and the time that preceded me as well was kind of a time when the city could sustain that kind of culture in a way that was really um, uh, like ideas could be inter interchanged and uh, you had the freedom to kind of do whatever you wanted. There was a lot of diversity of, of types of music um, in terms of, you know, this college radio genre. Um, and you, you had like more of a, a sense of like energy between the the non-college people, there was a lot of interplay with those kinds of bands and people coming from Greensboro, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, all kind of cross-pollinating, UNCW and places beyond, people would just move here and it, it did have that sort of um, fertile ground for, for that sort of thing. I don't know if it's quite as, as, um, as weird as it used to be in Chapel Hill, it seems a little more with all the hotels and people uh, getting pushed out with cost of living issues. Um, some folks from that era have just moved away recently even. Um, so yeah, but it was, yeah, but that's definitely uh, this, this resource of like um, a lot of people with, with built-in ideas and audience um, at the same time that can interchange quickly. So like um, some bands would form from conglomerations of those types of things I'm talking about, and then you'd have a built-in audience and a built-in kind of culture um, that would support that. Yeah, and to bring it back to Pine State, um, I think we can open up the questions in just a minute, but to bring it back to Pine State, they were all, or mostly all uh, WXYC uh, people, and so uh, names that I would hear when I was there, but you know, people come to Chapel Hill and then they move on and so that a lot of these were names that I would just kind of you know I think I'd heard the name Charlie Spate but didn't know much much about it but I think the important thing or what I'm 
my connection to WXYC is that that really, um, you know, I can't even describe what it felt like to go into the station and see walls of records and see all this stuff that you just could not find anywhere. And again, I keep saying it's like before the internet, you just couldn't find that sort of thing. And so it opened up uh, this whole kind of uh, universe and not just the records, but the people there uh, who um, I could go do a whole roll call, uh, but I'll just mention Franz, uh, Franz Kunst as, uh, as one who um, I had lots of debates and discussions and uh, we would get so worked up over the, uh, the most inconsequential things, but uh, I kind of uh, realized that, you know, it's not about your, I don't care what someone's personal tastes are now, is that back then I would have, oh God, you don't like this record. It was really more that like we cared about this stuff and we would, we, we cared about it to the point that it was what, you know, brought us together even if we were things we are. You know, Mark Sloop was another one. I remember we had an extended debate over uh, Sticky Fingers versus Exile on Main Street. And I don't even remember which side I was on. <laughs> but I just know I was on one side. And, and uh, so uh, I definitely, uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm uh, very appreciative of Dan for being here and not only uh, taking the spotlight off of me a little bit, but also just uh, it sort of symbolizes that era for me as far as uh, the, the formative influences of people who were just a couple of years older but seemed so much more experienced. and. Uh, Really, uh, yeah, I, I wonder what it's like to, to grow up in this era. I mean, it just you can't even imagine, but that's a topic for another day. Yeah, I do listen to the station, and I do think that the spirit of discovery is alive, and you hear DJs um, discovering things and creating their own culture and playing things across. Um, but it, the town, I don't think, has that same sort of um, cascading effect where people are sticking around for five or ten years and, and sustaining the culture. One, one good thing about the radio station is that after you graduate, um, you can continue to DJ and be there at the station beyond that, um, which kind of keeps that continuity going and, and creates a, a better thing. But the whole um, town felt like that, I think, um, in the 90s. And you do get some of that in every college town. I, I think that's still happening. There's a lot of great uh, stuff happening now. I mean, I think um, when it comes to mind is uh, Hot Releases, uh, Ryan Martin's label. I don't know how many folks are familiar with that. That's like a whole underground scene that is sustained in the area. So it's still happening, but it, it's different at the same time. <laughs> um, and uh, to that point, I mean, I, I think some of the freedom that some of these bands had to reinvent themselves within a show even or to bring in different band members or have three or four different personalities uh, uh, acting simultaneously. It's a lot harder to pull off when someone can look you up on the internet and see your mm -hmm. discography like within a matter of seconds. Um, and also uh, things that were done, um, you know, that you probably wouldn't do now in an age where someone could throw it up on Facebook or, um, or social media like, smashing up you know the majority of this area <laughs> uh, you know i just wouldn't do that uh in here um but in, in the old days you you could have levels of satire and seriousness and um chaos and and musicianship all within the same stage often within the same band um, and i think a lot of the bands that the chapter that you sent me are kind of have that performative aspect. Um, you just you can't pin down, and if you do, they will change it on you. Like as you were saying, um, the Greg Turkington would, you know, uh, respond to things he didn't like, or Neil Hamburger if, if he was getting heckled would <coughs> like cough over the heckling. It's pretty much like that, and then say something else, and it becomes a game, almost like a code um, that you know was created on within the performance and then sustained and then uh, carried on. And, and you see it all over now. You see like all kinds of shows like that now, but um, they're shows. They're not happening in a laboratory uh, where the animals have escaped. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, I, don't, I don't have any grand uh, like remarks to, to add to that, so I don't know. Uh, Shall we? Uh, we can open, open it up. up. We have tons of stories to fill yeah, the we can... space if we don't have questions. I 
question. Oh, yes. Um, well, one thing is, before the internet, were ba a band's aspirations, I think, are different. Like now, not only can you get on YouTube the first time you ever pull your hand over a guitar, but also people aspire to, um, you know, I mean, even I was in New York in, in the 80s, and, and it's very, the underground scene stayed underground. Now there is, if you're a band, you kind of have to move up, and along with that comes branding, where you were saying, Dan was saying that you could change what you're doing as a band. Nowadays, you don't you have to kind of even out your product? Yeah, yeah there's a lot, there's a lot there. That's, you know, another, another change that um, it, it's when it, that comes to mind here is the whole alternative music revolution of the 90s and grunge and Nirvana, and, and so many people would mention that as something that wasn't the first thing to happen. Um, there had been some sort of business, businessification of the underground in the 80s and different attempts at it, but they generally failed. And that was kind of a good thing for the music. And there's even a, an early chapter in here that um, touches on some of that. And all the way back in 1979, out in uh, San Francisco, there was a label that uh, was trying to sort of move in and uh, market uh, this new music, whether they call it punk or new wave, and uh, if you think about, uh, they were not from the Bay Area, but a band like The Knack, My Sharona, something that uh, sort of takes this sound, packages it, and gets sort of broadcast out there. So there were, there were bands like that, and opportunists like that already uh, at that point. And so it's kind of part of this push and pull. Um, I guess I was definitely drawn to ones who, not only were they not thinking about success, they almost actively repelled it. Uh, whether they did so consciously or not, they would almost do things that would make it impossible to succeed. Uh, there was all kinds of, uh, you know, whether it, whether it was, you know, doing the opposite of pandering to their audience, you know, in terms of, you know, not giving the audience what they want, but the audience is expecting one thing and they're on to something else, or, uh, you know, making it hard for people to figure out what they were doing, uh, not really, um, Lots of people used, or lots of the groups used some kind of mask or costume or something like that. And so um, they were almost, uh, that was kind of a theme that really runs throughout it. It's this almost allergic uh, uh, sense of, of success. Uh, the one band that did, in the book, that did become successful uh, was, was Faith No More, and there was some and even ambivalence on their part in terms of how they played with that and the idea that they were almost doing this idea of like selling out as or at least the way they rationalize it is selling out is almost like a, a, a prank or a stunt in the sense of you know there i think there's more depth to them than what comes across they might be thought of as kind of a red hot chili peppers type band but um they had a lot more depth but yeah it, for the most part, that point about bands not thinking about success, it was the furthest thing from their mind. And then branding would have just been, um, one person actually mentioned that at the very end. She says, nowadays people talk about their brand and, and it just, you wouldn't have even considered it. So it was a much purer, purer, more pure time in that sense. It seems like it. I mean, it seems, sure, seems like sure. it. Yeah, yeah. Also a lot of branding. It's it's easy. Well, it's easy to success. it's easy to mythologize. And even the book talks about them kind of being at odds with the Matador label oh, and yeah. um, some of those bands with Creed and other stuff as well. But and just in the band I was in, we integrated someone from that punk rock era of the '70s. This guy Nicholas Petty, who was a chef here in town and uh, ace guitarist, and had been in a band called The Blessed. Is that yeah. Right? The Blessed in the 70s, and then so he was in our band, which is pretty much, you know, would not get him anywhere except a chance to do what he wanted on stage and to play freely. Um, but simultaneously, he was playing with like Ryan Adams' band at the same time. So you, you're getting like divert, even when it's not in this nice framework of someone's like career where the different bands for Greg Turkington or some of these other folks have like a, a really nice fabric. You, you also have people just taking divergent paths simultaneously and there's some overlap there, but um, 
you know, he could play both ends against the middle. He could be in one band, and you, you get a lot of that around town um, with people playing, like, you know, they might join Dexter Romlover's big band for a while, and, and they'll do something, um, you know, that's completely obscure, and do their own thing that, like you're saying, like, it's not really um, based on branding, but just doing what they want to do. And that freedom is, is I think, super important to, like, this kind of scene and, and to me like the more I thought about this book and, and the chapter that you sent and the preface it, to me it's like um, people were really taking advantage of having the privilege of being able to express a lot of different ideas freely um, you know we would take the country music genre and then overlay like the art ensemble of Chicago that you're probably familiar with like the little instruments like the little slide whistles and things and have that kind of overlay um, with like serious, ridiculous satire of country music mores with um, deep appreciation of the music simultaneously and then also a fight would break out. <laughs> um, and someone's drums might get thrown down the steps and um, then we would come back and sing a song. So It's a rev reverent irreverent, maybe. It, 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 it's not this binary of you're a serious band or you're a joke band. And that was the chapter I sent him in particular. It, it talks about that because different eras, it, it would maybe uh, certain things would, there were eras where let's say punk rock is pretty direct and stripped down, but you had other stuff going on say in San Francisco that was very theatrical that came out of um, different underground theater uh, groups. Uh, and then that sort of filtered through uh, groups like Tuxedo Moon that had uh, very theatrical elements that they would incorporate. And then Carolinaer, who, uh, Carolinaer with an ER, they played here in 1998, and I saw it and was completely baffled, but they had, they had one of the most elaborate stage shows that you would ever see in a small club, like the local 506. That's just mind boggling. Uh, and very, very theatrical in that sense, but, the accusation would sometimes come along that hey, these are joke bands and I'm really into serious music. And so the chapter that I sent Dan last night was really all about that. And there's a lot of really intelligent people. I mean, the, you, you'll read rock books sometimes that are maybe quick reads, but you know, maybe it's the Motley Crue biography and it's all about sex and drugs and, and whatever. But there's a lot of really uh, erudite people who I had the opportunity to speak with. I, not pretentious, they, you know, there's, there's a sense of humor, but there, there's a lot of there's a lot of concept in what they're doing that is um, really. I almost think you don't have to like them to to appreciate the points of view and kind of changes really change the way I hear all kinds of music. Uh, thinking about uh, these ideas and uh, again, it's nice to have the. It was a real. Uh, pleasure to be able to discuss these things with people who would talk about them, but not resort to uh, academic speak. That wasn't the language that they spoke. It was much more uh, intuitive. Now, somebody might mention that they were reading in Arto or, or uh, somebody else, but it wasn't really about citing your references and having spent some time in graduate school uh, in academia. That was very refreshing. Uh, the, where it was coming from was a uh, not unintelligent place, but still an intuitive place that wasn't, you know, it wasn't constantly being justified with citations or references. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely, yeah, I mean, definitely that, that is an interesting aspect of it. And, and, yeah, we're talking about like overlaying the art ensemble concept of small instruments. It really wasn't that, it's more just convenient and sounded good you know to integrate such certain things like that um, oh I didn't mean it that way oh no no but I was I wanted to bring up this other thing because you could take those types of concepts um, this art Arthur Arthur you've got yeah. how do you say it I think it's Arto. Arto. Yeah. anyway whoever that is I'll know I have to get a book out to figure that out um, but whether it's like that um, Arto or whatever you could overlay those things so if you're reading about like um, uh, Joseph Boyce doing some performance where there's a play I read where he was like in the library 
uh, where I was in the library and read this play, you know, uh, to the voice book where he like does this stuff and then two people just wander out and leave, you know, um, we would do stuff like that, um, but improvised. Um, so you could overlay that stuff and, and express those ideas that are supposedly like book ideas from Anton and Arto <laughs> and all these people like that. Um, I think that you know that still happens, but it was really a time when you could experiment um, without that internet um, presence um, of being right behind you um, all all of the time. You could get away with stuff that you didn't do so well and and try something else. And now, now that you mentioned it, it reminds me that the art institute, the San Francisco Art Institute, definitely played a big uh, role in how things developed in. In San Francisco, I mean, there's uh, on the East Coast people. Well, you'll read about RISD and Talking Heads, and a lot of the New York bands having of uh, the '70s having connections to there, and that's what gives them a certain kind of pedigree. A lot of these groups came from uh, the, the early groups, late '70s groups came out of the San Francisco Art Institute, but rarely would all of them be art students, and a lot of times you can't tell. Like for example, Tuxedo Moon was probably the, the artiest of the bands, but they were not an art institute band. So um, they met at a community college. So, it, it, you know, so I, I think it's good that there is that mix, but it never gets too academic. And to bring it back to the uh, X-rated hot dog vendor, I was definitely, uh, for, for a little period there at XYC, getting way into some hoity-toity uh, music that took itself a little too seriously. So there was a sense of humor that, uh, Again, without being based on a joke with a punchline, uh, there was a sense of humor to a lot of this stuff that helped kind of help me snap out of, of some of that real seriousness, where everybody is listing who they played with and where they where they studied, and, and almost trying to justify it as being like correct. Yeah, that kind of insular like indie rock class system or whatever. It's funny you mentioned RISD because I mean that's uh, kind of ties into the. Uh, local scene now where you have the more beat and art oriented music with the hot releases it's kind of anchored in Chapel Hill Carborough but then there's a circuit of people going up and down the coast um, and a lot of that has to do with RISD uh, in the current day model of what we're talking about it's totally healthy and happening um, so yeah I just thought of that how involved was Neil Hamburger how involved? Well, he was, you know, as 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 Neil Hamburger. Uh, well, the, the the character of Neil Hamburger is mentioned at the very end, in passing. That then Greg himself was very helpful. Um, he was instrumental, I would say, because um, you know it's one of these things where I didn't I didn't want to make I didn't want to be overly reverent to any one person in the book uh, in a way that would be awkward, but. Um, Certainly, from my early experiences emailing him to meeting him after a Neil Hamburger show, to interviewing him as Neil Hamburger, to uh, you know when I did when I did my article on Bruce, who you've heard me talk about, um, you know Greg was the one who who uh, put me in touch with him and said, hey, this guy's trying to uh, to kind of come out of retirement and do this show. Maybe you could pitch an article on him, and so I got to, to know Bruce, uh, who's kind of a, a legend in a sense, uh, you know, um, but uh, very, um, let's just say, he's put a lot of, uh, ah, a lot of these people who are 60, you know, who are around 60 now are, are kind of like 60 going on to 90 as far as the mileage that they put on their bodies and stuff like that. So it's, he's, he's yeah. Um, but, but, you know, and then definitely uh, Greg uh, and, and another friend of Greg's, uh, Brandon Kearney, put me in touch with uh, this guy, Eric Cope, who was a Sri Lankan, uh, who was originally from Sri Lanka, and he did this scene, and this was from 1985, and so this was definitely helpful. So I know it was kind of maybe a joking question, but, but it was kind of like the, the early stage of the book was the, the networking of people introducing me to this person and this other person. Uh, and I did a whole lot of interviews and learned a lot of stuff so that when I started reaching out to people for cold, I could at least kind of write a decent intro letter uh, to them. 
know a little bit. But when I was starting, I mean, why would it? Why would anybody know a lot about this stuff, especially somebody who wasn't there and grew up on the East Coast? Yeah, I and mean, there's a whole bunch of other folks like that too, as well. I mean, it's really it goes back to what I was talking about about the uh, ability to put forth ideas. The idea that uh, this fake comedian would be on the same stage as a rock band and be touring around with that is just pretty cool. But there's other like mad men and mad women who were uh, putting out records, and um, you know, there's a guy Jeff Jensen that we played with who did his own. Frank calls and had like a Brooklyn enclave and um, and these folks kind of carry the culture in the way that the internet search engine might carry it now and yeah. and even though um, it's not that simple um, people are still doing label work and, and sustaining the culture it's like Neil Hamburg is an example of someone who crossed over into like a national consciousness uh, because for whatever reason he propelled himself in that direction um, but there's a whole bunch of other, um, not copycats, but simultaneous people with similar ideas based on the cultural, like, what's in the water at the time that um, who are operating around the country and doing just several albums of crank calls. Um, and Neil Hamburgers is one that kind of came out of that, that small time, like, uh, do-it-yourself thing and then crossed over onto a stage and then crossed over onto a TV set and a computer screen all in the same kind of linear path, for example. Yeah, and I think even, even he was surprised that that was the character that um, that did it because he had so many different things that he did and he couldn't have predicted that that would have been the one to stick. And uh, Yeah, that's what I like about the book is it draws those connections and it does it in a very understandable way. I mean, it takes a doorstop book to just kind of get through the ones that Will's talking about in that region, but it even you could probably be like, okay, here's another region, right, right, and it would be a different book. This just happens to be a very seminal, important um, uh, birthplace of so many different things. Yeah, I think I think city in terms of U.S. cities. I mean, I think there's still a book that could be written about Chapel Hill in the '90s, but I'm not the one to do that, but. Um, but I don't think covering 15 years in New York City would be just too much. And then LA is too big. And, and uh, San Francisco is seven miles by seven miles. And um, population is, even now, it's you know, less than a million in, in the city limits. In the late 70s, it was at a low point. I looked this up. It was at about 680,000. And so, um, and, and it's even at seven miles by seven miles, most of the cultural activity is taking place within a, a small part of that. So even though it's a it's a cultural center, it's it was small enough that you could have continuity, um, or you could find continuity and, and see these connections. And again, I I think to get much smaller, there might not be enough connections to get a bigger city. It would be just too overwhelming. But I would, yeah. I'm, I love. I've always loved the, to read books that are kind of like this, to the extent that there are books like this. And I mentioned in the preface, uh, the book "Our Band Could Be Your Life" uh, was one that I read that covered the U.S. in the '80s, um, and didn't have anyone from San Francisco. But I felt like, hey, I, I would. I kind of had that as a blueprint, and then the, the form of the book was definitely different. But uh, yeah, reading about the, the the way the culture happened from the mouths of the people who actually experienced it and did it, as opposed to the way that it gets packaged and resold and presented. Uh, as I'm experiencing now firsthand, when I go into a place and they have their 90s alternative music playlist on, and it's kind of like, oh, so this is this is the 90s. And so I think part of it is, is to try to convey a little bit of, of, a, of a non, uh, of a history that isn't, I don't know, that isn't packaged yet, yeah, the packaged history that, that um, this, these are, yeah, that so many of these people resist being packaged that uh, I think they, they're well suited to that. Kind of. This is totally off topic, but you just reminded me, our discussion reminded me of the Chapel Hill band of Doug Clark and the Hot Nuts. Um, <laughs> and somebody was telling me that they would, 
you know, have a designated Doug Clark so they can take three gigs on the same night and play three different frats, mm -hmm. like in, you know, NC State, UNC, mm -hmm. and, you know, Virginia. Let's say I'm making that up. But, for example, and then, you know, you'd have your, your Doug Clark <laughs> at each one. Um, and then the band had enough bandwidth that they could send out two or three different bands to play the show. And, uh, yeah. You have Doug at three different places, and so I mean it predates the era to have this kind of thing, but it really is specific to these kind of communities where you have that kind of bandwidth and anonymity at the same time. Um, this is kind of analog era that we're talking about, um, but yeah, you, you made me think of that. I don't know, I don't know why. You see the metal pipes. Now, are the majority of the bands and the folks you interviewed, are they still in the Bay Area? Have they kind of spread out and dispersed, or what's... That's a good question. I, most of them are defunct, and, um, you know, you had some that have reformed um, in more, not always the most authentic uh, formation. So, for example, Flipper, there were there were a lot of, of, of deaths in the in the early stages, especially. And so Flipper would, would be one where they had two front men who were trade off, and one of them died in 1987. Bruce was the other one. They tried to reform in the 90s. It went disastrously. Um, they reformed again in the 2000s. They reformed again without Bruce in in the 2015s, and so uh, or the mid, mid in, in 2015, and they still tour with different singers and so it's kind of a, sh a shame you can't really blame them because they it's their kind of their living uh on the other hand it it uh, cheapens some of what they did and because it's you know um a lot of the other ones they don't really there's not financial incentive to do it now at the event in san francisco next week uh, toilet midgets will be playing uh not under that name uh, but the two guitarists from that group are still alive uh, and have still been playing music. And they're kind of a rare case of, of, of a group that never, never did a re, uh, never did a nostalgia thing. It's just always wanted to, the main guy has always wanted to, he, he was from the, one of the early punk bands, Negative Trend, that played in 1977. And I talked to him and he's a very quiet uh, guy. Uh, Greg Gray, um, but he said, you know, punk music wasn't, punk wasn't supposed to be a style, it was supposed to be the, like the end of rock music and then you do something else after it. So his his idea was, you, you know, so he didn't want to keep that band going, he was going to do this other thing. And that other thing was meant to be something that could evolve and, and, and not be like a sound or a style. And um, so, they they make sense as someone to you know to perform there, but you know a lot of the others there you know they might get I'll get back together if there's a record reissue, but so many of these things uh, back then bands just would, would form and they would break up, you know and nowadays a band that formed in the year two thousand might be on their tenth album and and it's kind of like you can't even tell the twenty years have passed because they don't sound that different. Um, that's another topic, but time seemed to have been much more compressed then musically that, that you could see a huge difference between 1978 and 1980, for example. And if you put up the records on, you can hear the difference. Um, and whereas I couldn't necessarily tell you the difference between something that came out in 2005 and something that came out this year necessarily because the recording technology got to a certain point where uh, and, and all the music that's available, we, every, everybody's kind of hearing everything all at once. So I'm sure there are certain things that are that are new, but it's harder to have that to find for me to find that progression. Right. I didn't answer your question. Well, no, but, I mean, but it seems like those bands were were more willing to take chances with their styles and evolve as they felt it was necessary as artists and, and bandmates to just do whatever. Whereas, like you referenced, something from '05 to now people get in that safe space and they're like, oh, this is working and getting likes or we're selling records or whatever and we're just going to stay in that lane, you know? Yeah, I can't imagine what <clears throat> what getting likes, uh, <laughs> what, 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 what kind of impact that would have right, on, right. on music. Yeah. Uh, unhealthy kind of impact. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, reinforcing that, that repetitive behavior. Right, right. right. 
I think there was a lot of these people would have if there was an if there was an unlike or like a mm -hmm. rotten tomato, they would have said, Okay, we're doing something like right. <laughs> <laughs> We had those all the time. And uh, there was like this undercurrent of internet uh, like people talking on the internet that existed back at that time, but it was an under it was a weird undercurrent. Like I remember in college I gave my email away to my roommate so he could play some role playing game on my bandwidth. Like, because there was no one to email, no one was emailing me. <laughs> it was still writing letters and stuff, and so, um, but yeah, the, the the likes and the dislikes came a lot closer <laughs> at the time. I mean, even when we played in like two thousand five, like some guy like we was like started trying to body slam me or something. Like, we had to do this weird martial dance around the circle. To resolve the conflict, <laughs> um, and there were certainly things thrown. Um, that just this just reminded me. I just pulled up this image. Uh, that I, it took me a long time to find this clip, but a couple of people told me about it. It says we can all. This is from 1983, an LA paper. We can all relax. We can all relax now. The search for absolutely the worst band in California was abruptly ended <laughs> Wednesday night when San Francisco's Popo Pies took the stage at the Music Machine. The twist is that the band would probably rel relish the honor of that title. For 45 minutes, the quartet alternated between two songs, a version of the Grateful Dead's Truckin' and a piece that featured a nonstop chord and sing-along about making donuts for the chief of police. Yeah. So when I when I first interviewed Bill, Bill Gold from Faith No More, uh, it was 2003 when I was writing an article about the Popo Pies, and he was he told me about that interview and, and, and laughed, and, and I think for him it was... Uh, it was, it was formative in terms of being able to get up and play in front of an audience and sort of take the beer cans and, and take the, the heckling and, and, and sort of get over any sort of idea of stage fright so that when they were playing, you know, 10 years later with Guns N' Roses and Metallica and all this stuff, they would, uh, and they sort of, he talks a little bit about how he, at least they tried to take some of that attitude with them into that arena. Um, literally uh, the arena but uh, even then they kind of got sucked into the music business machine and sort of you know he talks about how they kind of lost a sense of who they were uh, eventually so it's kind of like um, even success would, would come with its sort of with its costs um, you know by the time they, if they're on Warner Brothers records the, the label is not going to relish being called the worst band in California so they have to sort of change their standard I don't want to, want to pull teeth, but uh, is that do I see, is that Tim Ross or no? no I, it's hard to see. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, he's X Y C. Um, if there, well, if there are no further questions. I can uh, say that uh, you are free to go. I appreciate everyone's. I did not mean to necessarily go for this long, but I appreciate everyone being here and. and uh, yes, thank you, thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you, Dan. And who else can we thank? Thank you to Riley Cooks. I guess I'm sure about the volume, like whether I should be talking with a mic or not. Yeah, it's a small enough room. Did you get the person to jack on the I do. Yeah. I do. Slightly bigger room. Yeah. 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 Yeah.